Okay. Hi. Welcome to this webinar. My name is Ludwig Enstaller. I'm a founder and general partner at 468 Capital. And I'm um, extremely happy to have uh, Dirk Abendroth, Tim Wigner, and Jonas Angulis with us today um, to talk about funding the next generation of European deep tech champions, um, something that's very close um, uh, uh, to our core mission at 468, which I'll uh, tell you a little bit about and uh, then hear a lot from uh, Jonas, from Dirk, and from Tim um, about their respective journeys of building Aleph Alpha custom sales workers, and to give you a great idea uh, and snapshot of our portfolio and about the amazing opportunities that we have in the deep tech space available in Europe right now. And uh, I'm uh, happy that we have about 20 minutes at the end of this uh, uh, session for Q&A, so very much looking forward to your questions, um, both to um, uh, our three CEOs and maybe also to myself. And um, with uh, without much further ado, I'd like to start. Thank you very much to Super Return for giving us um, the podium to to present ourselves here. Um, as I said, I'm one of three co-founders and general partners of 468 Capital. 468 Capital. Um, was started um, uh, by myself, by my two co-founders, Florian Liebert and, and Alexander Kutli, who are basically a bi-continental technology fund um, um, with about 1.5 billion uh, euros under management across different strategies um, with a very strict focus on um, uh, deep tech. And, and we can talk about what we mean by that, of course, in a second, but predominantly we're active in the fields of uh, artificial intelligence, enterprise software, and um, uh, uh, workflow automation, but also have an interest in energy transition and and, and Dirk over at Custom Cells, of course, uh, will be um, uh, just one example of our activities there. We um, uh, invest across stages, um, uh, um, primarily in, in early stage, but also in the public markets. And we will soon be on the market with our growth stage product, 468 scale, uh, which we're launching next year, which is uh, basically 1 billion euro fund focused exclusively on the growth stages on the B, series B and C companies, um, uh, which is which is essentially a space that is, is pretty much uncovered in the European tech ecosystem. So we're extremely excited to bring that product uh, uh, to the market. And uh, maybe this is of interest to um, uh, uh, to you, to your organizations. So more than happy to to discuss that in, in further detail. Now, um, I think what, what we wanted to do is, is basically give you a snapshot from our point of view, because we are inherently European. We're based in Berlin and in San Francisco. We have a strong focus on the European tech ecosystem, in particular on the German tech ecosystem, which um, has been the powerhouse and a driver of much innovation and ge value generation over the past 10 to 15 years. Give you basically a snapshot and an idea of where we think the ecosystem stands today and, and where it's headed. Um, basically, I think we've seen um, over the past years, in particular in 2020, 2021, um, we've seen um, the peak of a boom cycle, which had been in the making for over a decade. Uh, I think it's fair to say basically since the 2008 financial crisis and the zero interest rate environment, we've seen a super cycle of funding, of financing of tech companies that has yielded some amazing breakout successes, um, be it Spotify uh, out of Sweden, be it Edgen out of the Netherlands, Zolando out of Germany, um, and many others in the European tech ecosystem. And um, those companies have essentially, almost all of them have been consumer facing, right? If you take a Spotify, if you take a Zolando and many other of the household names that you know, those have all been consumer facing internet companies, uh, mobile internet companies that were there when, when this, especially this mobile revolution brought fast and broadband internet to, uh, to households and enabled new app based super business models. And uh, I think what we're seeing, what we've seen in, in the last year, basically starting three or four years ago, but really at an accelerating pace seen over the last 12 to 18 months is a shift back from funding consumer-based business models, B2C business models, to funding true technology, right? So 
traditionally venture capital was all about pre-financing um, technology. It has shifted to pre-financing marketing and growth in the past 15 years. And I think what we're seeing right now in particular in this somewhat more prudent environment is that there has been a shift back to funding true innovation, true technology, um, and, 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 and basically this cohort of companies that um, are based on uh, uh, severe and strong innovative depth and, and core development of technology, right? And uh, I think that's where we stand. And, and I think all those businesses, all three of them that we have with us here today are a perfect example for those cases, exciting examples for those cases. Um, I think what's also new is that in the consumer wave, maybe with the exception of Spotify, but certainly a lot of the businesses that you know, Zalando, HelloFresh, those businesses were European companies for a European market. So essentially businesses that um, adopted a globally successful business model to the European market and serve this European market. I think all the businesses that we're talking about now really are looking um, to serve a global market, truly innovative companies serving a global market out of Europe. Again, I think this is a uh, um, a bit of a, a bit of a change in direction from what we've seen previously, and um, I think obviously what we saw in the last couple of years is um, a lot of money going into venture capital, in particular going into early stage venture capital. So some of the most promising founders, repeat founders in many cases, and we see some repeat founders here today, um, have have started businesses were super well financed by early stage. Uh, funds. And I think right now we're in a reset of the valuation um, uh, uh, environment. I think 2022 has basically given us a big reset in, in, in growth valuations. And I think next year, a lot of these companies, amazing companies that got seen over the last couple of years, will get into the stage that they're raising a growth round. And I think supply of growth capital may be a little bit uh, less dense than it was in the previous years. So I think if you take this amazing cohort of venture capital supply and the somewhat more muted demand and the somewhat more muted supply in venture capital, I think the 2023 cohort in particular out of Europe of deep tech companies would be an amazing opportunity to invest. Um, so um, that's why we are extremely proud to present you with some of the most promising businesses out of Europe that will be raising capital um, over the next 12 to 24 months. Right, so without much further ado, um, I would like to start by introducing you to the first of those three businesses. It's a company called Aleph Alpha. I think it's the hottest space in the world right now. Uh, it's it's uh, artificial general intelligence or AGI. I think there's not a single day that goes by um, where you don't see a massive funding announcement um, or spectacular breakthrough in AI. And Jonas and Aleph Alpha out of Heidelberg are right in the midst of that. We're very proud with the first investors of Aleph Alpha back in the day in 2020 when Jonas started out uh, with his second business, having sold his first business to Apple very successfully and now uh, is tackling the space of artificial general intelligence. Jonas, thank you so much for being here with us. You are a serial entrepreneur. It's your second business, so we can call you a serial entrepreneur. I think that's fair to say. You're based in Europe, and um, you are one of the leading experts in your particular field of deep tech in AGI, artificial and general intelligence. Um, could you talk us through your personal and your entrepreneurial journey uh, so far? That would be great. Yeah, happy to do that. Thanks for the introduction, Ludwig. Um, so I'm like a classical uh, software guy, classical nerd. I started coding like professionally at the age of 16. And then I got an engineering degree from, from Karlsruhe, from KIT. Uh, I wrote my thesis about base network. So I was kind of doing what uh, AI, even before deep learning was cool, um, working on on random forests, support vector machines, the kind of technology that uh, preceded the boom. Uh, and then with the with the company I started, Palace Ludens, we had perfect timing in that we 
the the wave of autonomy technology, the wave of computer vision technology. That was basically uh, the first big hurrah for deep learning. We were phenomenally positioned for that. We built technology that uh, that really only we could could offer at that time, uh, and that led to a, a phenomenal growth. And this also then led to me. Um, joining Apple AI R&D leadership team um, in their special projects division. So special projects, meaning the stuff you're not supposed to know about. Uh, a lot of that is autonomy, but like, uh, Tim uh, Cook has also said that augmented reality is for him absolutely crucial technology. And I've also spent some time with Siri AI R&D. Um, and one of the big um, things, one of the, the, the thing that really impacted me uh, substantially in that time is um, that there was there was an AI technology on the horizon that um, surprised me fundamentally, not only myself, but also the phenomenal experts around me. Um, see, when uh, the, the kind of old technology I built my company, uh, the last company on, that was all based on human labels. So humans were creating uh, labels, annotations, and a signal that the AI was able, uh, learning to replicate, and that would basically limit the AI in in this one thing. So if you had an AI that was um, detecting uh, pedestrians, then this AI would never be able to do anything more than just detecting pedestrians. It doesn't matter how much data, it doesn't matter how big you would make the system. And then it, uh, during the time when I was at Apple, a new generation uh, approach, a new generation of AI that does not require any human input and is basically just learning from observing the world and understanding its complexity. Yeah, and that kind of blew me away. And I knew that I need to work on that technology. This will change the world. This will be an industrial revolution. And I also was convinced that I need to come back to Germany and do this uh, starting here. So that was 2019. Um, and that was kind of the journey leading up to Aleph Alpha. Wonderful. And we'll hear much more about you and about Aleph in uh, just a bit. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'd now like to introduce Dirk. Thanks for being here, Dirk. Dirk is the CEO of Custom Cells. And um, Custom Cells is um, uh, one of our portfolio companies. And uh, uh, much more than that, they are the builders. Uh, they built the batteries for the Porsche Taycan or for the Lilium flying taxis, flying jets that they ever fly and for many other exciting projects. Um, they are the leaders in their technology field globally. Uh, there are many, many battery companies um, that promise great things for the future. Customs have, as Steve Jobs told us, great inventors, great artists actually ship. Custom cells actually ship. So one of the few exciting businesses around the world in this great new space that actually ship at scale already We've got many more projects coming for the future but dirk why don't you tell us about yourself and and about the business thanks very much for having me um yeah let's start with say custom cells the company custom cells actually develops and manufactures high performance cells so battery cells as you mentioned so that's that's the core product but around this is um this is simply very much complemented by digital products so for example for traceability but also lots of services and um, finally uh, by that you mentioned that earlier we are right in, in the forefront of, of energy and transition of uh, nearly everything and yeah how far did we get so far um was, was kind of the the question the two co-founders um, actually um, managed to, to develop um, and manufacture cells for more than 10 years um, and to actually grow the, the business uh, profitably for, for 10 years. And now we simply enter something like a new stage. So, so we enter from, say, developing uh, and uh, figuring out uh, new cutting edge technologies and now trying to push um, these technologies into scale markets. So into different businesses like um, automotive high performance um, premium areas like Porsche, you mentioned Porsche as one of our customers and investors. <clears throat> and at the same point in time, also to be one of the key enablers also for um, uh, exciting applications like eVTOL. Uh, you can imagine that finally the battery technology now actually comes to the point where um, it's, it's just say possible to actually think about flying taxis and similar applications. and, and um, yeah, Custom Cells is one of the few players kind of really uh, being there today already. 
and that actually is one of the most exciting places to be. So um, we are in business since 10 years, um, but still it feels somehow like a somehow a little bit like um, startup-like you know, on the one hand side, but on the other hand side, we are in the transition to, to industrial um, scale and, and growth phase. So that's where we are currently. Uh, my personal background actually is in electrical engineering. I always said uh, like to touch base on, on technology because I like it very much on to a certain degree a hybrid. Uh, you could say, in the sense, like I've I've hold different positions in corporates, like BMW have been uh, actually one of the instrumental players in the launch of i8 and i3, uh, which was emotionally very exciting. Um, but also have been uh, named um, a continental CTO, so I know um, the OEM and um, Q1 side and the pain um, and automotive when, whenever it comes to margins and um, actually earning money. Um, and at the same point in time, I was lucky enough to um, to join startups uh, mainly in um, Silicon Valley and in, in, um, in China. And um, what I what I realized is that this might be simply kind of a good complement to the two co-founders. So that's why I joined Custom Cells. And well, if you ask me kind of what routes may actually back to to Europe, and I would like to kind of make a similar comparison like what Jonas did. Um, for for me, it was always um, that I that I realized the most important thing, no matter in which organization you are and what, what is the size of the organization or the cultural background, the most important thing you need to manage actually is, is human engineering. So you need to deal with people, feel their emotions, and uh, finally get a connection towards towards uh, your tasks and skills and your business you need to maintain. And then I realized that most of this human engineering is very much based on your values. And that's where I realized that I'm very much rooted uh, in Europe, because the European value set actually is a very valuable uh, part. You can start off to build business. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dirk. And we'll hear uh, more from you in, in just a second. And Finally, our uh, third uh, uh, company CEO in this round, Tim, welcome. Thank you for being here. Now, um, Tim, you are active in a field where I think the two leading, globally leading businesses um, were European businesses. I think it's fair to say that UiPath, which went public, um, I think a year and a half ago in New York, out of Romania, and um, uh, at Salonis out of Munich, which I think is Germany's most valuable a uh, venture-backed private company valued at 13 billion earlier this year are the two uh, leaders in uh, global leaders in your space of robotic process automation um, of, of workflow automation basically so um, the domain of automating using software to automate uh, repetitive white collar tasks tasks in the office and you are part of this exciting, amazing new cohort that marry this technology with machine learning, uh, with applied artificial intelligence to automate tasks on data that is not fully structured, that is not free of mistakes or faults as most data in this world are. And uh, I think we met when you were pre-launch with your two co-founders in, in a shared office. Uh, you just raised your Series A, now assigned very big enterprise customers and uh, on an amazing journey. And, Love to hear more about you and, and how you came to starting uh, uh, Workist. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the introduction, Ludwig, and for having me here. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, basically um, what we do is, in comparison to Aleph Alpha, we're not working on uh, artificial general intelligence. We're actually working on uh, artificial specialized intelligence and very specific business processes. Um, we picked out um, common business processes that are very yeah, they're commonplace all around B2B trade. Um, and we automate like very document heavy processes in this space. Um, for example, whenever a manufacturer is shipping things all around the world, um, selling it to wholesalers and so on, what's happening is you have a ping pong going back and forth of documents uh, that need to be filled out, um, that, that need to be received and so on. And so we're talking invoices, orders, we're talking confirmations and so on. And what was quite surprising to me and my two co-founders is that in this space, basically everything is still very manual. It's all going back to very manual work. Um, you have sometimes a hundred people that are doing very, very repetitive work in this space. And um, yeah, it's something that is not limited to any specific country or limited to any specific region. This is actually a problem on a global scale. Um, 
Um, what, uh, yeah, what's maybe quite interesting is that, uh, so uh, we as a team, we're all um, scientists of sort. I'm a physicist from my background. Um, my two co-founders are computer scientists. Um, but um, what, like what, where my journey kind of changed is I um, joined McKinsey after my studies. I went uh, a lot into basically B2B processes, uh, understanding how businesses work, what their biggest problems are. Um, and um, I was part of a bigger team that was based in San Francisco and looking for the most impactful disruptive technologies that the next 50 years would, um, yeah, would spawn. And the, the one on the top um, is basically uh, artificial intelligence being applied to automating work. So making sure that basically all of us are much more efficient that we're using our precious time in a much more efficient way. And so this is for us um, actually the mission. We, we want to we wanna make sure that basically the work that can now be done by machines and this, this share of the work um, is growing by day, um, that this work is actually being done by machines so that we all have more time to spend on very specific and creative and value adding tasks and not on just the clutter. Hi Ludwig, could it be that you're still on mute? Well, there seems to be uh, some problems uh, with with the audio. I'm sure we'll have it sorted out in a sec. Yeah, we're getting we're getting a question uh, in the chat. I'm I'm taking that. I think that's a great question. What is uh, Europe's relationship to deep tech and deep tech funding? And this is really something that um, I was when I when I started out uh, the out of Alpha in in Germany. Um, I was getting a lot of questions about that. A lot of people were kind of asking me, why, why are you, are you stupid uh, starting a, an R&D deep tech, AI R&D deep tech company out of Germany? Um, and yeah, you, you, of course, we, we all know that historically speaking, um, there weren't that many. There was a lot of e-commerce. There was a lot of different businesses happening in Germany and in Europe, but not that, many, not that, that much deep tech. But I think this is really changing. This is changing with a new strategic perspective that some select VCs are are developing or have developed. And we're now seeing, we're not the only company, but we're now seeing phenomenal world-class deep tech uh, funding rounds happening out of Europe. So I think this is really great. Um, and this is um, close to my heart also because we care about technological sovereignty. And I think for technological sovereignty, the funding sovereignty in Europe is an essential ingredient. Um, let's. I want. I, I want to. I wanna, uh, uh, can you hear me now? We yes. do. Yeah. Wonderful. So I, I want to give uh, uh, the audience a chance to um, uh, to connect a little bit more. Uh, to your uh, individual missions and to hear a little bit more about the problems that you're solving, um, and and maybe maybe uh, maybe Dirk, um, why don't you tell us a little bit more? Um, what makes custom cells special? What is what is the technology 
that gives you the moat, that sets you apart, that makes world-class companies and brands like Porsche or very exciting high-tech businesses like Lilium and many others that are in the pipeline um, choose you over the many alternatives. Tell us about custom cells. Tell us about custom cells five, six, seven years from now. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. So uh, let me put it this way. First of all, straight away, if you look at a battery cell, it might look, you know, very, very simple. You just need, you know, an anode and a cathode, some copper, some aluminium, um, put in some some powder and fill in some liquid and give it some some wrap and that's it. And uh, easy speaking, that that's indeed it. But if you look into the details, you'll figure out it's to a certain degree one of the key components in very many different systems. And so what, what builds the magic source or what makes us unique? I think it's to a certain degree our history. So I think you always need to have a certain history to go into into future and to be also brave enough to tie different things. And in battery, um, in battery um, business, everything is usually kind of, you know, a, a pretty complex system of, of, of different aspects you need to manage at the same point in time. And uh, our USP in the end builds out of three different aspects. One is to, first of all, identify what, what is maybe the magic material you need for nodes to reach very high energy levels and power levels. So that's one thing. Second thing is then obviously that you need to make sure you get this supplied, et cetera. So it's to a certain degree kind of a logistic and a, and a legal aspect and a um, something you just need to prepare. The second aspect then is very much technical and it is, okay, if you get kind of no very high performance materials, you need to manage uh, somehow to actually put them into in a proper way into the cells. So it's a manufacturing related aspect and you'll find easily that in comparison to electronics and software, et cetera, very much of the, um, of the IP say something like 70 to 80% is actually somewhat connected to uh, manufacturing and uh, all logistics around of this and um, other conditions you need in a dry room, et cetera, to finally be able to, to manufacture that. And then last but not least, it's about uh, the product itself and also some uh, technical USPs, which actually kind of build a very high performance um, um, energy level and performance level. And here comes the, the trick. Um, there's very many good batteries in terms of energy density and very many good ones in terms of uh, performance, uh, say power. And uh, the key thing is to actually bring those two things together. And one of the key things is, for example, to simply lower the um, inner resistance. And that brings a couple of very um, uh, different aspects to the forefront, like, um, um, for example, to have high temperature cells where you don't need cooling, et cetera. And that actually brings me now to, to exactly where are we in five to 10 years. So, so I mentioned we are uh, in the end to a certain degree a startup, still very, very close to IP and R&D. And we, we're going to stay that because we believe if you'd like to enter the market from the premium level, and that's where, what we do. So really um, attracted Porsche and Lilium and others because we are not just, you know, um, another battery company just promising to have the next best battery um, available, it is we make a real uh, a real difference. Yeah, so we can really build a USP because our batteries are more expensive, they are more innovative. But um, um, players like uh, Porsche see an opportunity to actually build a USP for their brand, and uh, players like um, Lilium and others see an opportunity to just make their technology first time happen. So we are the key enabler, and that is actually what excites us to be, uh, you know, a kind of a very live player of this energy transition because we see this coming. Um, it is obviously a different time uh, scale. So obviously automotive market is simply here now. It is driven by regulation. It's a given one. There's no alternative uh, given by regulation. And at the same point in time, uh, we do see that aviation is running into kind of a very similar situation. So CO2 emissions, et cetera, will play a role. We, we do see CO2 emissions are a net worth um, um, a, a device. And one by one, it will penetrate aviation as well. And obviously, um, this is where we'd like to, to grow. And at the same point in time, we are very much investing also into the new technology next generation, because we would like to be also the first ones jumping into the next, uh, what comes after. It might be aluminum, it might be all solid state, but we like to uh, kind of really play into scale, but stay at the forefront of uh, technology. So that, that's where we're heading for. And Tell us maybe maybe as a follow-on question a little bit about your favorite use cases um, uh, 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 that we could expect from you in the future. 
right now we've got fast cars and flying taxis what where else are we going to see custom cells <laughs> yeah so so one of the kind of you know very um uh, say um long lasting experiences we have in our company actually is autonomous underwater vehicles that might sound crazy but and then there's a couple of um, submarines out there uh, screening actually the ground and uh, mapping actually uh, the sea. Um, also, um, uh, surveillance of pipelines, etc. Quite, uh, quite um, 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 on topic at the moment. Um, and there's a couple of other applications we see, for example, in satellites. Uh, we've got lots of applications, for example, driller driller heads. So, which actually collects data deep in the earth and needs to send up uh, and operate at very high temperatures, etc. Uh, it might sound far away, but here's just you know, an experiment um, for your thoughts. So, think about kind of a driller head operating at 150 degrees, for example, centigrade, and uh, try to translate that into a car or into a uh, into an airplane. And then, obviously, um, you 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 can't operate this currently at uh, 150 degrees. Uh, everything is operating up to 40 degrees, and then needs cooling. And the cooling actually is a very significant cost factor, for example, for all vehicles. So that's a couple of few thousand dollars uh, per car, and that actually brings this into a certain um, opportunity to simply get rid of these costs by just replacing the um, the regular cells by high temperature cells. So what we are still doing is to explore in other industries to then make a bridge towards new applications. And that's actually what excites all of us. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Dirk. I think I think uh, not many more uh, uh, projects uh, that are as exciting out there right now. Um, uh, everything that's going on on a macro level, but also on a micro level industry. Uh, I, I think you guys um, had perfect timing. Uh, I know this has been a decade of research out of the Fraunhofer Institute. Um, that's now coming uh, to life and, and into production. So super exciting to, to be part of this journey. Thank you so very much. Um, and uh, Jonas, I, I think um, speaking about uh, good timing, about exciting timing, I think when we first spoke um, uh, 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 two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, you just come uh, out of Apple to whom you sold your first business and um, you were you were telling me about artificial general intelligence that you know we'd seen the first wave of neural nets and um now um you know this is going to go much further with large language models and everything that's going on and i got deep and deep into the field and you were so right about this and now i think in particular this year um which generally is more muted in our industry but when it comes to agi i think completely nuts we see new funding rounds uh, you know speculation of open ai doing things, uh, stable diffusion is in everyone's mind. Go here, we hear rumors, of course, deep mind within Google. And you are right there with all of them. And I think you are, I think, the only one I know, or one of the very few players in this field who have set out right from the start to, uh, to serve the enterprise customer, right? You're not, you're not deliberately not doing a stable diffusion. Or, or similar way of letting prosumers generate their own charts or uh, GPs at VC funds like myself now auto generate their um, investor newsletters, but you are going after the enterprise customer, the large government sector in particular, with a full stack approach of your own hardware centers and just about everything else. Tell us about that. Tell us about your mission, um, about the customers that you're serving and what sets you apart from all your global competitors. Yeah, thanks. That's an that's an excellent point, actually. So um, this technology is phenomenal, right? We can we can re revolutionize human machine collaboration, and we can have AI do things that I would have myself thought to be impossible just two years ago. The problem, however, and that's one of the reasons why OpenAI is actually not making that much revenues currently, is that it's not easy to turn that into a robust, scalable enterprise use case. It's it's pretty straightforward to play around with that and be surprised on some of these examples. But when you actually think about what this means as the foundational layer for the next industrial revolution and, and what the tools are that enterprises that govern, uh, governments need to, to um, 
take this technology and make use of its transformative potential, then it's actually not that easy to do. And this is what we set out from the very beginning to do. Um, you mentioned correctly, we build our own data center and this is not co-located. This is basically everything we own the whole building. And one of the reasons we did this is we wanted to support technological sovereignty end to end. And so we wanted to not be reliant on any kind of piece in the, uh, in the puzzle that could take sovereignty away. And of course, when you're talking to some of the biggest enterprises and government government customers, then they, they deeply care about safety, they care about security, they care about where their data is. And so we basically build a wrapper of technology around these models. And of course, we have partners that are basically just using our model as they would with a GPT-3 light type model. But we've built a wrapper of technology around it that enables um, use cases and integrations uh, that you can use and that are basically enterprises from all around the world are using without any need for machine learning know-how, without any need to solve linear al algebra uh, equations. I, and, and this is really kind of turbocharging the use and the scalability. And it's, of course, also giving us the option to price on a value-based pricing. Um, and so that's kind of hugely attractive from our perspective. And I think um, what what you've built in terms of your own data center is uh, in the top 100 of the supercomputing list already. I think if we filter down to commercial use, you're uh, amongst the first two or three dozen um, um, uh, in the world. So you really have your complete end-to-end -end own setup to serve enterprise customers with their data, their data security needs, and just about everything else they would need. Tell us about, I think your first customers are the large branches of government, be it defense, uh, be it security, be it um, um, municipalities. Tell us about some of the use cases that you're just launching. Um, I think the city of Heidelberg and potentially many more communities in Germany are now doing uh, or basically automating um, uh, across many different languages, which of course is one of your strengths. Tell us about that very briefly, the first big project to go live. Yeah, super happy to, to elaborate there. So uh, you mentioned the city of Heidelberg, and uh, we are, you're right, right? We penetrated uh, got the government sector on, on all levels. So on the, on the law enforcement and intelligence side, on the defense side and on the administration side, and this on a uh, city, municipal and at federal level and with the, uh, with, uh, kind of the, the countries. So basically on all kind of levels focused on administration. So focused on the knowledge worker of the, the future. Uh, with the city of Heidelberg, we launched a conversational uh, module that is leveraging the knowledge base of the city. And this is uh, compared to chatbots, and we're very deliberately not trying to build a chatbot. Um, compared to these technology of the past, we have no canned responses. We have no pre-built dialogue trees. We just have the generalizable model that can do all kinds of tasks, can summarize texts, can write articles. But of course, it can also have a conversation. And it's doing that just by reading and just by having a look at this the information that the, the city uh, of Heidelberg wants to make accessible to its citizens. And one of the things that I really care about when looking at that is that this technology is so robust that it understands what a human is asking about, even if the human has horrible spelling, horrible grammar, is mixing up languages back and forth. Um, so, and this makes this information and these systems accessible to humans that in the past would always struggle uh, to participate, to get access to uh, services and information. So I think that's what I'm really excited about. But yeah, this technology is also like we're working with, with HPE and with Oracle. So we are also scaling this technology to knowledge workers in an enterprise uh, setting. Wonderful. Wonderful. Very, very exciting mission. Thank you so much for sharing uh, uh, some insights, Jonas. And um, uh, Tim, um, I, uh, I would now like to, to, to talk about Workist. Um, uh, Tim, you have basically um, uh, uh, decided to, to take the pioneering work of, of companies like UiPath 
like Salonis to the next level and and to basically marry um, the the workflow automation space with machine learning. Um, you're now shipping to some very large customers. I think guys like Deutsche Bahn, PepsiCo are customers of yours. Um, and uh, uh, tell us tell us what you do for these folks. Tell us what you automate um, already and um, where this will take you in the future and, and kind of take us on this journey a little bit on this revolution and automation that's happening in the office right now already, maybe without many of us noticing, but basically what you pitched me two years ago is, uh, is turning into reality. And I, I think we're going to see exponential increase of all of that. So tell us, tell us what concretely Workers does for a company like Pepsi or Deutsche Bahn and, and for many more in the future. Happy to, Ludwig. Thank you so much um, for that question. Um, so basically what we are looking for is always, um, it's kind of work that is, that is basically um, happening all around the world. And so it's, it's always very like, if you look at AI and the, and the potential that it has, um, it is, it is an, on an exponential curve but you have to basically check for the kind of tasks that are now already being able to be solved with the help of machine learning and AI um, that at the same time would really touch a lot of people. Um, so what we found out is that uh, once again, in this B2B trade realm, you have a lot of documents that still go back and forth. And this sounds very old school, but this is actually the way that big uh, wholesalers and retailers such as, as Rewe are still ordering basically from their producers, from their manufacturers. And so um, once again, like what if you if you look at companies like, for example, PepsiCo, um, they will have orders thousands every day that come in from all around the world uh, that they have to work through. And at the moment, the, the only real possibility is to throw a lot of people at that problem. So you have hundreds of people in, in each individual company uh, of that scale, um, but even for like mid cap companies, you have at least 10 to 20 people that do nothing but, for example, order entry. And so, um, of course, this is only a beginning. Um, but what we see as a as a huge potential is that you do have these use cases um, that now only since about a year are at scale solvable with the help of machine learning and AI. Um, and you have to look out for exactly those use cases. And what we see now is basically you have all these different documents coming in um, for these companies, and they are still struggling to to handle all of them. In the end, we want to be the um, the interface for B two B trade. We want to be basically the layer on which all communication that is happening between suppliers and buyers, uh, wholesalers and manufacturers, where all of that happens. Um, because the, the big problem here is still that you don't have like a very simple individual API that is running between individual companies. Um, each company has their own ERP systems, they have their own IT. Um, and if you want to be a trade partner of these companies at the moment, you still have to make a one-to-one -one connection. And this just doesn't work. If you have 10,000 business partners, trade partners, um, then you cannot, you just cannot do this uh, at scale. The beauty of AI is that you can basically take all of this unstructured input and you can take all these documents, Excel files, whatever people use nowadays, could even be faxes. Unfortunately, that's still a big thing. And you can basically bring all this data into structured format. And then in the end, basically IT systems talk to each other. Um, because the, the big problem here is that basically if you have, um, if you have IT if you have IT systems that need to talk to each other, but you have humans in the middle that basically do the translation, that is just incredibly inefficient. So instead <laughs> what we do is we make it possible <laughs> for IT systems to talk to each other directly. And it doesn't matter what kind of formats and what kind of languages, whatever are in the background, because it all goes through our system for our AI. And then you can basically order from China, you can order from uh, any place in the world without having any kind of, um, yeah, you don't lose any information on the transition. And I think that's definitely a future that uh, I envision here. Wonderful. So basically, what you do as a first step, right, 
if a client sends your customer an order in a PDF format or as a fax or wherever, your software, your AI guided software, aided software can basically type that order into the ERP automatically without any human in between, right? That's something that at the moment, Absolutely. many, many, many workers do at B2B companies and you are freeing up their time by giving them a piece of software that does that automatic, right? That's your first very scalable Absolutely. use case that you have, first of many, but that is already in production. Absolutely, that's in production. And, and just to give you an idea of the costs that are happening in this specific field, just order entry and basically handling orders, that is the market of over 300 billion or over 300 billion are producing costs um, every year um, just to translate basically orders into something that a machine in the end can read again. And it's all people, it's very manual labor intensive. And so um, absolutely, I mean, like. The nice thing for us is we're working with a lot of um, mid cap companies that have somewhere around uh, somewhere between 50 million and a couple of billion in revenues. Um, companies like Centis, for example, are also um, among our customers and they typically don't over invest in AI projects at this point. What they want is they want to have a solution that actually solves a very simple but very big problem for them um, at scale. And so what's, what's really nice for us is we basically have a very positive connection to these mid cap companies. Now we're helping them to solve their first problem. Um, but basically what we are is we are their automation go to people. And so in the end, if you need any other basically uh, workflow automation, um, 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 help, then, uh, work is, is going to be that solution yeah. that is basically going to automate this not only for your company, but on a scale um, for all makeup companies of uh, a certain um, industry. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, three of the most exciting journeys um, in, our, uh, in our tech portfolio. Um, now, I think we have uh, uh, 10 minutes left until the top of the hour. Um, so looking forward to your questions, if you have any. So first question that we have is in which deep tech sectors is Europe excelling the United States from a startup ecosystem point of view? Yeah, I mean, interesting, uh, interesting question. I think one, um, one field is, um, is workflow automation or robotic process automation. Um, um, I think um, uh, European companies have been the pioneers there and I think the next gen of those companies um, or a lot of the, uh, the the market leading businesses are coming from Europe. So I think uh, uh, that's definitely something where Europe might be a little bit ahead. Um, I think also what's, I, I'd say not ahead, but actually where some of the most interesting projects are originating right now is the entire open source software movement. Um, so we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of opportunities um, in, in open source, so uh, open source projects that have been developed within larger uh, uh, European companies that are now being commercialized in their own right. So we're seeing, um, we just funded a project um, that came out of the European team, Alibaba, um, Apache Flink, a company called Imorok, extremely exciting. Um, there's um, uh, exciting open source projects that got spun out of a Spotify now. So open source, I think, is very strong at the moment. And then, yeah, I think energy transition. I think there's, and, and custom sales certainly is um, uh, an example. I think, Dirk, what you can do technologically, if, if the question is about the comparison with the US, I think there's one Chinese um, um, competitor in the market that can do similar things to you, but probably no one in the US at the moment. So um, uh, battery technology and, and certainly in, in your particular domain, Dirk, I think uh, Europe uh, is, is very well positioned. 
Yeah, a couple of things that changed significantly to take over here. So, um, you know, just 10, 10 years back, I remember most of the OEMs um, actually just, you know, uh, figured out, okay, that, that battery cells will come out of Asia, and we just focus on the BMS, the battery management system, so the control unit, and, and that's it. And the, the remainder is um, is just not of interest. And that um, obviously under under you know, uh, that has undergone a significant change in terms of thinking. It came back to Europe uh, that most of maybe the, the intelligence and the, the differentiation opportunities relies back into, into cells. And that's why we are back in this area. And I like it very much. And there's a couple of other aspects which have changed uh, the approach significantly as, as well. If you now, for example, look into very modern battery cell manufacturing, you find dry rooms, etc. And dry rooms, per definition, simply have the request that no human being actually is present or as little as possible. And obviously, the human labor was always one of the key um, aspects not to have battery manufacturing in Europe. And that turns to actually countryside right now. And it's, it's rather okay having engineers. And that's obviously where we do have a, a large skill set uh, in Europe. And uh, yeah, another aspect I wanted to, to add, you know, far away from, from what I'm doing now, but which is to certain degree very much connected. I was deeply impressed, actually, that in terms of energy transition, especially um, nuclear fission, um, uh, 4 zero is, is very much driven by, by Europe. So there's very many different companies, for example, in Denmark. Who thinks about Denmark when it comes to nuclear fission? There, it's, I think, just, you know, four or five uh, very successful startups um, in nuclear fission, some even in fusion. Um, there's lots of companies in France. So Europe is also kind of now growing up and, and you know, getting back towards energy transition might be um, a case for us. And I, I like that very much because it starts building ecosystem. And that, I think, is also one of the big strengths of, of European uh, culture, to build ecosystem from the very beginning. And uh, straightforward, um, especially building battery batteries, is just about um, ecosystem building. You can't do this alone. And it's very much about building synergies. Wonderful. Thank you. The next question we have is um, uh, as follows. In the past, revenue was the main criterion for funding beyond pre-seed. How is that different in deep tech, given the maturity and assumed scalability? Um, super interesting question. Um, I think um, I think if you're building, and, and, and we have the perfect examples here, um, I think Jonas, um, you you raised the Series A. I think pre-revenue, right? And I think generally, um, for many many companies, th that is a necessity, right? If you are building technology that you know requires a lot of human resource, very expensive, you know, engineers, researchers, and the like, or um, you know, as, as you know, custom cells in your case, Dirk, even hardware. Um, then obviously you have to spend a lot of money um, before you generate any revenue and a lot of time. And, and, and certainly that requires one or two, maybe even three funding rounds before you go to market. And we definitely see that more and more often. Um, of course, for us as, as investors, that doesn't make it easier, right? I mean, if you um, invest a significant portion uh, in a company that, that, that isn't shipping yet, then you take an even bigger risk. But I think there are several milestones that, um, you know, at the end of the day, you can assess. Jonas, what would you say, um, other than revenue, um, was something that people were interested in, and, and, and maybe as a wider lesson, as a deep tech founder, um, what you have to demonstrate in order to raise funding? I mean, your competitor, Stable Diffusion, just raised as a billion pre-revenue. So obviously, that is possible. But what would you say is what, what funds are looking for at growth stage pre-revenue? Yeah, this is this is an excellent question. And of course, certainly as an AI or D company, and like I've, with, with all conversations we're having, we're I'm making it clear that um, you have to have a certain mindset and a certain understanding as an investor to be happy with what we're doing. Because on the road to transformative AI, um, there will be increasingly more uh, investments necessary into AI R&D. So, so we're, we're not in a, in a position where we basically have built something and we now can monetize that. We still have to 
focus a lot on further research and on kind of reinventing ourselves and staying um, on the same level as the world's best. So, so that's from a cash flow perspective that looks slightly different. Um, and um, however, I, I really um, care a lot about proving that the technology works and proving that the technology actually has the ability to be the foundation of an industrial revolution, right? And this is, uh, and for for every activity we're currently uh, engaged in, or especially an activity we've been engaged in over the last year, that was basically done to prove the technology, to uh, find references, to penetrate strategic markets, to work with strategic partners. And there was none of those engagements were just to uh, maximize revenue. And we're now at a situation where we're basically changing from a proof of concept, um, a, like, um, a pilot stage into a multi-year uh, stage. And, and of course, the, so, so we're kind of in this transition, but nevertheless, right, for, for all our funding needs, um, a, an investor that would be looking purely at multiples, purely at revenue would probably not be the right investor for us. Good. Thank you so much. Um, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, I know there are many uh, more questions, which unfortunately we couldn't uh, we couldn't address here. Thank you for being so active. Thank you for being here. In particular, thank you to Dirk, to Jonas, and to Tim. Uh, thank you to Hannah for organizing it and the team at um, Super uh, Return. I think. Um, you have our contacts, our email addresses. If you want to continue the dialogue, don't be a stranger. Please reach out. Um, and, and I think that also applies to our colleagues and friends over at Aleph Alpha at Custom Cells and at Workist. So uh, thank you very much for being part of this and for your interest and hope to speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, thank everybody. Bye-bye.